Well, hello, and thank you for coming to this uh, discussion about my five-year journey as a regenerative explorer. Uh, when I got the call from Michelle at EHF and she said, hey, Adam, we'd like you to talk about some of the work you've been doing, um, I wasn't sure exactly how to approach it because it had been a few years since I'd given a public discussion and with what I've been going through in my mental development, I wasn't sure exactly how I wanted to give this. So what I decided to do was frame it in two halves. Kind of the first half is the journey that I've been on. And the second half, I've decided to focus on three different companies, uh, one in the US, one in Canada, one in New Zealand, and talk about um, what they're doing and how that relates to a regenerative built environment. So I'm coming to you today from Toronto. In Mohawk, it's known as Tokoranto, it means the land with trees with their feet in the water. And it's been the home of many, many people, the Haudenosaunee, the Wendat, the Anishinaabe, the most, like, uh, most recently the Mississaugas of the New Credit. This is the area of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum or Treaty. Uh, this is a treaty that was set by the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and the Mississaugas. And the idea was Tokoranto area was meant to be shared by all, and the dish with one spoon was the idea that it was an abundant area that was to be sustainably managed by all the groups, so that they all shared in the diversity of, of the area and what it brought to them. Now, since then, since this group came, uh, there's also been other groups that have come to Canada that we have to acknowledge, the enslaved peoples that were came here against their will. We have many, many groups of immigrants who came and helped build this country and were treated abominably. We need to keep our minds around all this as we start to reconcile and, and look at what is the future of Canada. And so it's with this kind of concept that the dish with one spoony, spoon wampum is meant to go from now, from when it was signed or when it was, when it was agreed to as long as the sun shines and the grasses grow and the rivers flow. So the treaty is still in effect as far as I'm concerned and I think trying to live by that treaty in Tokoranto is an important thing for us. When I came to New Zealand in 2018, I, wasn't, I was honestly not feeling real great about human species. Um, I was feeling pretty much we were going downhill pretty fast and the um, outlook was not good. And I just want to share this video that I did just before coming to New Zealand for the induction and uh, give you a little feeling of what I, I was feeling before coming there. As you can see from the video, I wasn't real like uh, positive. But I, then I came to New Zealand and I met these amazing people, amazing, amazing EHF fellows that were brilliant and young and doing both heart and head stuff together that it was, just blew me away. So this was the beginning of the change of my entire life was this experience in EHF. Uh, for those of you that remember my talk in 2018 at New Frontiers, uh, when I was first inducted, um, I expressed this to you, that, that, that coming to New Zealand, my mind was this big, and leaving New Zealand, my mind was this big and expanded. It was just, it was the most, um, probably the most growing I did in a short amount of time ever in my entire life. So what happened to me was I went from a point of a dried, shriveled, dark heart to the 
fellows I met at EHF put a little spark in that heart. And what I did was took that tinder and gently blew on it until I could create a flame. And I am so grateful to my EHF fellows for giving me back hope. So now we come to the first milestone in this journey, big milestone for me, which was meeting a mentor of mine, Famwina Tafanai. She's an amazing Samoan woman who, we were sitting in the induction the very first day, and about three quarters of the way through the day, Famwina raised her hand and, I, and said something along the lines of, you know, being in this group, I no longer feel like I'm the only weirdo in the room. And that's when I knew, oh my God, this sister has got my heart, you know, and I was just drawn to her. And it turns out that Famwina is, besides being brilliant, also incredibly giving and incredibly open to helping. And she helped me using her methodology of Pacifica wayfinding, which she teaches to corporations and groups and individuals, of how to untangle the unknown and go from where you are now, which is I wanna do something that I have no idea how to do, to actually getting it done. And her kindness and sharing to me, with me, of this concept uh, is what actually allowed me to take this journey on in the first place. So what I learned from Famuina, and Famuina, if you're watching, thank you very much, was this values compass needed to be really core pa principles of what I was trying to find out. So on my values compass, there's three points. The first point is regeneration. And when I say regeneration, it's becoming kind of like one of those useless words like green architecture, right? Regenerative to me, whenever I'm speaking about it, means healing. And that's as simple as it is. You can always pull it back to that anchor of healing, whether it's hearing a healing of self, healing of relationship, healing of place, but it's healing. So regeneration, regenerative thinking, that was one, one uh, point on my compass. The second point on my compass was um, the economic system. And the economic system that I was looking for was one based on abundance rather than scarcity. And for us Westerners and settlers and Pakiha, we don't understand that the concept of an economy based on abundance comes with a corollary concept of enough. And if you don't have the idea of enough, you're not going to understand the concept of abundance. And when Westerners think about abundance, they think, oh, so everybody gets a gold toilet bowl. And that's not the way it works. So we've got regeneration. We've got an economy based on abundance. The last piece is kindness. And when I say kindness, I don't mean like filial kindness or romantic kindness or that type of love. What I'm talking about is the kind of kindness that Martin Luther King talked about when he talked about building the beloved community. And this commitment to human species, humankind, and to the connections that we all make and to the um, direction we're all going, this is what I'm talking about. And so these are the three points on my compass. To employ this values compass technique and this wayfinding technique, what I did was I employed a methodology that I started using in 2012 called re-evolution. It's a theory of mine that societies can evolve or devolve. And when they evolve, they kind of move forward in a way that is progressive in terms of how they're treating their society, but it's oftentimes without a lot of forethought. And devolving is very simply what happens when uh, regressive stuff goes on in society. If we kind of look at the United States today, in 2023, we can say it's maybe devolving a bit, right? Well, re-evolution is not evolution or devolution. What it is, is looking back at history, at the things that you had thrown out before as, as eschewed and as bad or not relative to or relevant to what we're doing or not based in the sciences that we have, have believed in or whatever it is, and looking back at history to try to re-evolve ourselves with intent and bringing back into our re-evolution thoughts of our ancestors that we had given up many, many, many years ago. So the way that I did this was a thought experiment. And the thought experiment was fairly simple. I imagined the world and it's history. And I imagine this history as not being written in words, but written in fabric on a weaving. And I could see on this fabric weaving, the textures and the patterns and the colors of history throughout the ages. And I could see on the loom where it's being woven right now is today. And I could see everything yet to be woven is tomorrow. So what I did was I said, well, if I do a completely theoretical thought experiment, 
and I unstitch that tapestry of human history back to a certain point, then I could theoretically restitch it together to have a different now. And so what I did was I just made one change. And I said, go back to 1500 and just imagine that the endemic diseases that were brought from Europe to the Americas were actually the other way around. They were, they were endemic in the Americas and they were brought to Europe. So what we do then is we scroll forward 100 years to 1600 and by 1600, we have 70% of Europe being severely compromised by disease. So that then allows me to completely restitch the history of the human species based on my historical studies that I'm going to be doing and have been doing and based on this values compass to guide me what this new today could look like. So thus far in the five years I've been employing this methodology, I've come to three realizations or, or, or truths so far that I've been using to guide my actions in the projects that I work with. Um, the first is decommodification of land. I believe that in a regenerative society that an individual would no more be able to own a piece of land than a sparrow or a tree can in today's Western society. That in a regenerative society, housing is part of the cultural um, commitment to each other. And that in a regenerative society, everybody gets a nest, but everybody doesn't get a nest egg, right? That's a big difference. The second thing is that um, a regenerative society, I believe, would have an economy basis in abundance, the gift economy, abundance, etc. So this is a really hard concept for Westerners to get their minds around because it just it goes against everything that we've learned for hundreds of years. But it's important when you're doing this kind of, of, of research and thinking to go as deep as you can. The last piece, uh, the last realization that I have about a regenerative economy has to do with intellectual property. And in intellectual property, I don't believe that would be commodified either. I be believe in a regenerative society, intellectual property would be shared to allow for leapfrogging and for increased faster growth and innovation. So these are some really pretty big differences between the way we think about economics today and the way we think about business today and the way we think about ownership today and the way that, that I'm actually pursuing it in the regenerative explorer. So keep this in mind as we go forward. So the way I did this was starting with education, simply by reading histories. And the first histories that I read were all New Zealand histories because I was an Edmund Hillary Fellow and I wanted to learn about New Zealand and about the indigenous of New Zealand and the Pakeha New Zealand and the whole culture of New Zealand. And so that's what I did. And uh, it's at this point where we meet a second milestone in, of mentors, and that's Hoya Lambi. Hoya Lambi was um, one of the Maori elders that was helping EHF uh, get their, their fellowship together. And um, I met her uh, during the induction through our getting to know each other. Um, I just realized she was really wise and she gave me a lot of really, really good advice over, over the course of time. She was the one who told me at no certain terms before I even recognized it that I'm a visual thinker that I think in pictures. And I was like, yeah, I do. How did you know? And she knew, and it was amazing. And, 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 and so Hoya had helped me through several different stages of this. And I called Hoya and I said, you know, Hoya, I'm getting, I've read a ton of histories and I'm getting a lot of information, but I feel like I need some personal touch and I need to be able to ask questions. I need to be able to interact, but something beyond just books. And that's when Hoya just blew me away with the best advice I could ever imagine. Um, although it, at the time, I didn't know what to do. And she said, you know, Adam, I'm really happy that you're interested in learning about New Zealand and Maori culture, et cetera, but you live in Toronto. We're currently in COVID. You're gonna be in Toronto for a long time. Why don't you learn about the people of your own land? That's really what you should be doing. You should be talking to those people and doing that learning. And I was like, of course, of course, that's brilliant. So what I did was taking Huya's advice, I just started reading everything I could about um, the history of the land that I was in and the people of the land I was in. So at this point, I started looking for a local mentor and one just showed up on my doorstep. <laughs> it was funny because I was at a, a choir gathering with some of my friends 
And I met somebody named DM LaFortune who was introducing me to my friend Monica. And DM had a course that she called, called Decolonizing the Heart, which teaches you how to think in a regenerative way and how to process uh, uh, the ideas of, um, of, of decolonization into your core self. Well, taking this course with DM just combined with the histories I was reading just launched me into a whole different orbit. It was amazing. And I am incredibly grateful for her guidance and knowledge that she passed on to me in this process. So while I was doing my research, I wasn't only reading histories, I was also reading other things. And three books that really, really focused my attention and got me kind of aligned to really get my mind around this um, were, were, were pretty significant for me. The first book is Robin Wall Kimmerer's Braiding Sweet, Sweet Grass. Robin Wall Kimmerer, if you don't know her, she's indigenous, she's also a PhD biologist, and her explanation of how the two worlds are melded in her just spoke to me. It, it's, it's an amazing book. If you haven't read it, please read it. The second book I read uh, that really moved me was Charles Eisenstein's Sacred Economics, uh, which talks about the gift economy and ways to implement large, on a large scale, different ideas about ec different economic systems. Then the third book that really helped me get this you know, really solidified in my mind was Mark Carney's values, where he talks about society's values, culture's values, and humankind's values, and how that all works into economic systems. So all these readings that I were doing were way out here, right? They're way up here. They're esoteric. They're big picture thinking, nothing that I could grab onto as a builder. But as a builder, I always want to take these big ideas, right? Like this big idea, and then push it down to something concrete, right? I want to make something happen in the real world, right? And so I started asking myself, how can I take these concepts and bring them down into the real world? And um, as we can see uh, later on, I'll show you some companies that have been doing that. I am also will tell you that my wife and I have um, been using the same kind of concepts in our businesses that we are currently in, and we're reworking everything we're doing around trying to implement in the real world these very fuzzy concepts that are out there in these books. So something else happened to me as I was going through this process. I was realizing that something was going on within me, internally, within my psyche. And that was, I was changing. All of a sudden, I was through self-care and reflective meditation and um, learning, I was starting to change my core on the inside in a regenerative way that really started to just make me walk around every day like a black lab with my tail wagging and my tongue hanging out. And I was just in an amazing mood because I was regenerating myself at the same time I was learning about what a regenerative economy meant. And what happened was this regenerative energy started bursting out of me in ways that it, it involved my partner and my family and my community and everything I was doing was aligning with this regenerative concept. Um, so what I did, what did I do? Well, the first thing I did when I realized how much I was changing, <laughs> and this was two years or so into the process of learning and, and doing the regenerative explorer thing and trying to figure out where I was, I, I was realizing all this change. And so I got in touch with my buddy, Bill Reed, who's been a mentor for me for quite a while. Uh, we were both on the board at Yester Morrow Design Build School. That's where I met him. He and I, um, uh, he introduced me to regenerative thinking in 2015, uh, to the point where when he did that, it just blew my mind. And I said, oh, I can't even believe like this is real. I can't believe people would really do this because I was so ensconced in the world of, you know, just design and construction. I didn't, I hadn't opened my mind yet. So I called Bill. I said, Bill, this craziness is going on with me. And uh, it's going on with me. It was, I'm changing myself. What's going on? And this is what he told me. Have you found similar things within yourself? I mean, when you started yeah. getting deeply into this, I mean, are you find, did, did it change you on an inside level? Like, I yeah. feel like it's doing to me. Yeah, profoundly. And uh, it has to, or else it's not regenerative. Hmm. So, because it's a, it's a whole system, right? Right. It's a, it's a nested system. So there are no boundaries in that change. So the thing that I learned through this process of um, exploration and regenerative thinking was that 
everything lives in these nested systems, that everything's connected. What I do as an individual, the way I walk in the world, what I do professionally, what I do with my friends, what I do with my family, what I do with my society, these are all connected. And so I started applying these lessons to the built environment and to housing and looking at housing as part of a regenerative system. And I started pulling apart the pieces to find that what I was talking about in housing prior to this was just a tiny, 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 tiny little piece of what the system of housing actually was. So as I started exploring this systems thinking and nested systems thinking, what I finally found was this concept of donut economics. For those of you who are not familiar, I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail. This uh, drawing here does represent what, what it is, but basically the center of the donut are the stuff that society provides for all and that we all have to make sure we complete that before we start getting to the outside of the donut. And so this idea of donut economics is what I used to start thinking about housing as a center of the donut item. And it's what I used to start looking around for what other people were doing as I started putting this presentation together to be able to let you know about what some of these other groups are doing. So what I wanna do here for just a second is to drop back and tell you one of the things that happened to me as I started thinking about what I was finding in the EHF fellowship. And that even though we need large systems change, we need large change, obvious, right? It's obvious we need this. Um, we're not gonna get that, I don't think. I don't expect we have the political will, we don't have the, the money behind us. I doubt that we're gonna get all that. What I started conceptualizing and realizing through working with all these EHF fellows is that what we're doing is we're creating tiny little points of light. I conceptualize the world that we live in now and the world we inhabit as the gray world. We live in a very gray world. And the world that I see us creating is this world of light. But we're not gonna create it in one fell swoop. It's gonna be a bunch of small micro actions by a bunch of different people reaching out until we can reach a um, congealing point where we start to push aside this world of gray. And it's our own individual actions, the way we walk, the way we talk, the way we interact professionally, personally, that will make that difference. And that for me was one of the biggest kind of realizations of this whole thing was that instead of being sad like that video I showed you at the beginning because we're in such a bad place, I realized that we could create light. And that's what I've been trying to do for the last five years. So my personal interest is in small entrepreneurs and in builders and designers, right? So that's, that's my personal interest. And so as I started looking around and seeing who was doing what and where they were doing it, and I, I started looking around going, okay, well, well who, who, who is doing this work? Um, one of the things that I knew for sure is that um, things like building passive house or low energy buildings, building emission sequestering buildings or uh, uh, these, are, these are buildings that capture emissions rather than, than, than get rid of emissions, than, than, than produce emissions. Um, uh, we can already do that. Uh, a modular uh, construction, um, a prefabricated modular construction is also a very key part of this kind of creating of these, of these high performance, low energy, carbon sequestering buildings. And for me, these all were baseline items. This is not the aspirational stuff. This is the stuff like, if you're not doing this, you're not even close to starting to be able to open the, your mind to the idea of regenerative thinking, feeling, and doing because you haven't even made the tiny little piece, which is your construction, come up to that level. So what I was looking for was people that had already done all this and were moving on to kind of the next level and really looking at the systems that they were embedded in within uh, their housing. So the physical bones of the building are just that, they're the bones, it's a skeleton. And the important thing about regenerative thinking is understanding that what goes on inside the building, the relationship that's built between the people that are in that building is what that housing is actually all about. It's not the bones of the building. With that, I wanna go on to these three groups that I'm going to now talk about uh, the work they're doing. So one of the interesting things about all three of these groups is they've gone way beyond where you and I would consider housing and they're thinking in systems, they're thinking in nested systems, they're inviting in or working with people um, who had traditionally been left out of the building process, the design process, the, the whole 
housing process, um, it, they have realized that for them, these small entrepreneurs, my peers, for them, money is no longer the object of what they are about, but money is a, a, an interchangeable form of energy that they can use to create change in the world. And by putting some of their privileged resources to work in making this change, they are now creating this nested system vision that, that will start to make the world a better place. So with no further ado, we'll go on to the first group. The first group is New Frameworks from Vermont in the United States. Um, they are already an amazing group. They're a worker-owned cooperative. They're doing uh, modular, panelized, uh, emission-sequestering passive house building already. And when they started looking around their um, region of uh, Burlington, Vermont, they realized that what they for them to go take kind of the next step as a company, they wanted to do something with housing. So they started looking into housing for immigrants, refugees, and they also started realizing that there were people in the community that were not being served or were not even being asked to work on this kind of stuff. And so they made a commitment to go out and actively seek to hire immigrants, refugees. They also, within their group, decided that they would, in doing this, commit to making their company a bilingual company, right? So everybody who, is in the business now speaking English is learning to speak Spanish. So the kind of commitments that New Frameworks is making towards change where they're saying, you know, we're putting our money and our thoughts and our actions up front and we are making change in the world today. This is the kind of forward thinking that when I met these guys 15 years ago, maybe it wasn't quite 15, maybe it was 12. I don't remember exactly, but it was a long time ago. They were already way out in front of everybody else, and they continue to be, and I laud them for what they do. So the next group that we're going to talk to is from, about is uh, from Canada. Uh, they are from Huntsville, Ontario, and it's Took Tree Homes. Took Tree Homes is already a manufacturer of modular emission sequestering panelized passive house buildings. They have also made um, efforts in their local community. They've built uh, affordable houses themselves. They've been working to figure out ways to make and bring housing to, uh, to their local community. But what's really exciting is they've partnered with a um, indigenous um, women's collective that does construction in Northern Ontario. And they've brought them into their factory. They've taught them how to um, use the tools and use the factory. They have created a, a house, they're, they're piloting this house, but the idea is that they are going to be using this women's construction group to create a, um, a factory in closer to their region so that as they scale, they're able to create in not only good jobs, but also good housing for the indigenous community. And here I want to read uh, just a short statement. Um, it's very important, I think, when working with indigenous communities to, to, to be able to give an accurate representation of what is being done. And so I had asked them specifically, can you send me something that I could actually say what it is, that, how you'd like to express it? And so I'm going to read that for you now. Took Tree has partnered with Keepers of the Circle, an indigenous not-for-profit that trains women and gender diverse peoples in construction with the hope to share the advances that they have made in building highly efficient, sustainably sourced passive modular homes. Together, they have piloted a first house that was designed by an elder and a young indigenous woman and then built by five indigenous women. Acknowledging the housing injustices that have been inflicted on indigenous communities through the colonization of Canada, this partnership is an example of a pathway to support localized capacity building to enable indigenous women to be able to provide their own communities with healthier and more resilient housing. So thank you, Took Tree Homes. Thank you, Keepers of the Circle. I think this is truly an uh, important, um, important example to the Canadian culture. So one of the really cool things about this whole Took Tree um, Keepers of the Circle thing is they're employing one of my basic tenets about the decommodification of intellectual property. And they are helping to leapfrog keepers of the circle into business by not being so concerned that money is the end of the, of the, of the road, more that money is an, uh, a, a form of energy that we can employ to have the outcomes that we're looking for. And that's what they're doing. This is why it's so exciting to me. 
The last group that I want to talk about is Nadi Toa, an iwi group in uh, the North Island, from the North Island. And um, this group is uh, making huge, huge uh, moves towards a regenerative housing model. And uh, they are not only doing housing and land ownership, but they also have regenerative concepts around the ownership of the land, uh, the stewardship of the land, the financing of the land, the profit that you can take on the land. It's, it's an incredibly um, interwoven and well thought through process of regenerative housing. So what I want to do is explain the concepts that we've been talking about with Naritoa. And uh, this drawing represents the, the thought process. And if you can see, the background of the drawing goes from gray to light, gray to yellow. And that's going from the gray world to the world of light. And you can see right in the center is this big circle that says gray world interface. That big circle is the iwi, okay? And you see over here on the far side, these small little pieces, those are small iwi builders. And over here on the other side in the world of light are EHF fellows. And I believe working together, we can get a system going that would actually take us way farther out of the greater world than, than anybody could do kind of individually by themselves. And um, so the idea is that actually seeing regenerative thinking in practice, what, 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 what got me really looking at Nadi Toa and, um, and, and, and New Zealand in particular was the fact that the Māori already have the concept of decommodification of land. They already have a, a concept of economic abundance in their, in their innate indigenous culture. The overlay of the Western culture on top of it can, um, has distorted this, but it also can, is being stripped away. And the exciting thing about the Māori kind of concept here is that this large centerpiece that interfaces with the gray world and is actually where most of the sausage will get made, right? So it's because trying to bring a world of light into the gray world can be quite messy. So the idea is by having this iwi collective in the center that's made up of multiple iwi, that that will handle a lot of the things like financing, design, and permitting, and um, uh, um, uh, any kind of uh, interface with the governmental entities, the regulatory entities, so that the small builders who are building this actually don't have to do a lot of this kind of front end big work that can be captured much more collectively under this bigger iwi umbrella so that the small builders out implementing in the regions don't have to worry about that. That's all being taken care of in the larger collective. And um, this idea I think is really amazing um, in, because what it does is starts to look at how do we allow the people that are building the housing that we need to actually get out and do the work we need to building? And how do we bring the intellectual work or the regulatory work or the financing work, how do we bring that under an umbrella, a social enterprise that will protect everybody, but still give us the freedom to actually go out and build houses? And um, when you're trying to get financing, regulatory, et cetera, as small builders, it can be a lot more difficult. So whether this will work or not, I don't know. We're, this is early in the process, and we'll see. Okay, now I want to get into a bit more detail about housing in Naditoa. So what we're basing some of this concept on is the um, Build Smart concept that I had developed years ago around passive house manufacturing. And the idea was that we created, me and a fella in Australia, Harley Trong, um, a system for building modularized emission sequestering building panels using a very simple set of jigs. And those jigs literally can be in a 400 square foot garage. And you can build the entire building in that garage with those jigs. And this is one of the things that's in our concept is that we see in this larger center, central Ely collective, a vertically integrated uh, material, building materials uh, collective. And we also see a central processing plant, both on the North Island and on the South Island, that will pre-cut all the pieces and parts that go into this uh, house, but then can be shipped on a very small truck out to the regions to then be put into the jigs and built by the local folks that are there. One of the other concepts here is that um, this collective 
will um, find, train, and help to put in business multi subcontractors, HVAC, plumbing, electrical, drywall, et cetera, et cetera. So the concept here is to leverage this EWE collective, the larger EWE collective, to be able to help housing become a system. And the idea that I've been talking about is, well, do we want to think about housing systems that talk about the maintenance and upkeep of the houses as part of this long-term relationship that the builders will have with their houses? So this is one piece of the discussion that's going on there. Now, another piece of the discussion that's going on is about using this software here that I'm show you real quickly. I just took off the shelf components of software and created a way to take a house and just grab out all the bits and pieces and it'll spit out a materials list. And you can see here from this video how this is a very simple thing. I mean, literally it's off the shelf stuff that, that was less than 500 bucks to create this. And the idea was all this intelligence would live in that EWE collective, right? Now, the other piece is the part over here, the part of the EHF fellows. And this is where I'm talking to you folks, the EHF fellows. This is the true world of light stuff. This is the stuff that me as an old guy who barely understands some of the concepts that these brilliant young fellows are, are having. Um, this is where I think that the EHF fellows could really help to take this to the next level because the work that people are doing on um, distributed autonomous organizations and um, uh, uh, gift economies and, and different types of um, what they call smart contracts. These types of things that I barely actually really know what I'm talking about because I'm old. <laughs> uh, these guys know lots. You, you fellows have amazing stuff. So what I'm hoping is that we will get to a process of inviting in fellows to help think through and conceptualize way to take this to the next level. Okay, well, whether this goes somewhere, doesn't go somewhere, I don't know. These are ideas, these are concepts, these are things that are being done. Hopefully it has inspired you somewhat um, to hear some of the stuff going on. Uh, if you're interested in, in learning more about what I've been doing, my learnings, the, the businesses I'm in, just contact me directly. I'll be happy to tell you all about that. But um, for this presentation here, um, I've invited three the, all three of the groups to come here and uh, I'm free to take questions now from the group and we're going to answer them for you. Thank you. Bye-bye. That's amazing. Can we both <laughs> just do like a little silent clap to Adam because that was really, really good. Thank you. Uh, Thank you so much for sharing your journey and uh, showing us the what got you there and where you are right now. I feel really inspired to have been a little bit part of that journey of yours when you first came to New Zealand in 2018. And I, I have a few questions. There was at least one question in the chat that I want to uh, bring to you. Uh, and for the rest of the people there, if you have more questions, please add them to the chat. But Adam, I want to, now that I, I guess you've been through this video over and over, through the edition and creating it, is there anything that you want to share with us before we go to the questions? Anything else that you want to add? Uh, well, there's uh, this video could have been eight hours long. <laughs> so, of course, there's there's so much more depth. I mean, you could do you could do a, a whole hour just on any one of those companies and the stuff that they're doing. I mean, it's all so amazing. So, no, it, that's uh, 37 minutes was as quiet as short as I could get it, and there's ton lots to say. But uh, I'd love to hear questions or comments from people. We've got. Uh, I don't know if, if Helmut is here. I, I didn't see him in the list, but we've got someone from, um, we've got Rick Zatorek here from uh, Took Tree. We've got Jacob Rakuzin here from New Frameworks. We've got Harley Trong here who helped me with BuildSmart, and Rob Leonard. So we've got lots of resources if people have questions and I'm happy to answer anything. Uh, I, I So Briar had a question. I don't know if you wanna, Briar, you wanna do it uh, live. But her question early on the video was, 
Why did you choose the movement, movement of these theses as a starting point of the thought experiment? So that, that was, yeah, that's simple. That was, uh, I had to start somewhere. And um, I figured at that point, you had, um, you had economic, social, cultural, technological contact between the entire world that then allows for spread for ideas. So uh, concepts around technology, et cetera, can be exchanged. But the only difference there is now that we have this exchange of, of contacts rather than those, those contacts um, overwhelming the uh, Western world, by by switching that disease going to the going back to to Europe, it allowed me to rewrite that history completely and to go into uh, the known histories of the uh, uh, local Haudenosaunee, who I've been that's where I've really been learning and and trying to project forward uh, what you looking at what they were doing at contact in, in the 14 1500s, what their societies were like, projecting forward what those histories to get these these realizations and. And, um, you know, it was basically just a point where the cultures mesh. The truth, honest truth about it is that this is just a thought experiment. But in this thought experiment, I, what I've realized is you probably have to go back farther than a few hundred years to make this actually work. But it worked for the purpose of this. I hope that answered it, Briar. Thank you. Uh, Frank, Crawford, you have a question. Do you want to speak to it or you want me to read it? You can unmute yourself. Okay, I will read it. And then if you have any follow-ups, you just unmute yourself. So Frank said like, lack, lack of capacity appears to be a big issue with prefabrication of building elements. What options or techniques or processes have you found to help increase capacity? Ah, super simple. So when we did the Build Smart concept, what we did was we started from the point of bootstrap. So what we created was um, a, a, a system that can be scaled from the small garage builder with two or three people up to as big as, as you know, build capacity. What the biggest problem with prefabrication in my mind, especially in, in markets like Canada and New Zealand, unless you locate a factory very close to a major metropolitan area, you know, because we have so much spread out in the regions in both places, that it's just not very efficient to do that. So if you find a way where you can take the factory to the place where they need to be, which is those small jigs that are very simple and standardized, that basically moves the factory to wherever you need to be. And then all you have to do is ship the sticks and then put it together. So the idea is you build capacity by building um, by building um, knowledge and making simple systems. The, the thing is, if you go out to the regions and you look in Maori housing, you might have it at region and they, you know, they're not, they don't have the resources or the um, capacity to build more than, you know, maybe 10 houses in that year, right? Well, you're not going to set up a whole factory for 10 houses, but you certainly could have a, a jig that could be, uh, that could have the materials shipped and you could build those 10 houses. And when you get to the point where you're building 100 houses or 200 houses, you get that financing, then you can start, you know, either making more or start automating. Either way can work. But for, um, for a lot of the problems in New Zealand and Canada, where we have such a large amount of mass of area and such few people, this was like the best solution I could think of to get us into far flung places that really need the housing. You know, I'm not worried about housing in Auckland or in Toronto, you know, but housing in Northern Ontario and, 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 um, and, 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 and on the East Coast you know, there aren't big cities there to be, put big factories in. And, and who's going to go put $25 million in a factory that's only going to produce 100 ha houses in a year? It's, it just doesn't work. So that's why. Oh, that's great. Uh, it's great to see the EWI engage and, and doing those, that the work that needs to happen localized to, to spread the word and support each other as community. Uh, Rick, do you have a question? It was more a comment uh, supporting that. Um, it, there is maybe a lack of capacity, but with the same number of resources uh, in a factory doing prefab, we can we can enclose more buildings faster than the same people out doing stick building on the on the site. So it's a another form of building that takes advantage of the capacity of a factory to create the elements that go together and put are put together like Lego. And then of course you need more factories and they don't have to have that many people in them as Adam is saying. Yeah. Thank you for that insight, Rick. <clears throat> um, 
Briar, you have a question. Uh, Adam, do you wanna respond? Yeah, did, did, it says, do I have any, do you have any realizations about uh, new ways to service the housing, water, wastewater, stormwater, energy? Yes, absolutely. Um, well, first off, wastewater, we ought to have a system, right? We ought to be using composting toilets, collecting the waste, recirculating it, making that a zero waste system that actually adds us symbiotically to our food security. So, you know, it's basically just, once again, going back and re-evolving, going back and learning about night dirt in China and then bringing that forward to the modern age. We could have jobs and 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 whole industry around wastewater. Um, as far as stormwater, yes, but the stormwater is really a much more expensive way to do it. But it's basically returning what we have been missing, which is wetlands and doing natural tertiary treatments of stormwater. And um, as far as energy, yeah, obviously we're talking about renewables, et cetera. But, but the thing that's really super cool about building a passive house is that when you build a passive house, you're talking about a, a, an energy system that's tiny. You know, we can do when we do a 2000 square foot passive house, um, we can we can get that to net zero with a three and a half uh, kilowatt system, which is nothing. So, so there's there's a lot of aspects around this that all are very detailed and go deep. So it's not a simple, quick question because they, you know, it's a, it's a lot of you could spend days talking about each one. Hope that answered it, Briar. Thank you, <clears throat> Tiago. Do you want to speak to your question? Yes. Uh, thanks, Adam. Very very inspiring. Uh, I'd like to understand if you envision something um, for the function of this DAO or which would be the, the asset and what would it uh, govern? I don't know if Adam's still there. Yeah, I'm still here. Yeah, no, I, I'm not exactly sure, but I would think that within this um, a gift economy, there would be ways to account for um, uh, um, intention and actions, but beyond just uh, building so that you can capture this uh, uh, organization that it's going to be, I, I'm not, you know, this is where, this is where the, the young, brilliant EHFers like you know the stuff. Like I only know that, that you have systems that will record and, and, and even out, um, um, uh, uh, I don't even know how to put it, um, resources, of, you know, that are that are highly distributed. I talked to Shiva about this, um, who's got a system like this that he's working with um, uh, small entrepreneurs in India. And, uh, you know, I really don't know that. I mean, I was absolutely 100 percent honest when I said I really don't know what I'm talking about, but you do. And that's the point where I think that EHFers can engage with this discussion and, you know, beyond this old guy just going, yeah, there's something out there called this and that, and they will, you know, a smart contract, so you don't have to negotiate and everything just clicks together. I got, I, I mean, I don't know. That's where where I encourage you to get in touch and start working in that area and try to figure out how you can enjoy that. Does that I, answer, Chicago? Yeah, awesome. I'll, I'll study the video and I'll, I'll contact you. Good. Yes, love that. That's the beauty of EHF, the mix of uh, knowledge expert and, and industries in one place to tackling the same the same problems, right? So Absolutely. yes, to connect you two. Uh, we have five minutes left, probably time for two more questions before I go into some that I have. Anyone in the room? Harley, yeah. Uh, hi, yeah, um, Adam. So, I mean, you're you've you've worked, you lived in the U.S., in Canada, and probably other places in the world. You've been in New Zealand. Are there are there challenges that are unique to New Zealand in in respect to housing? Um, and are there are there things that you've seen in other parts of the world that that you think could um could, could help with, with these, these issues or, or, or are, the, are the challenges that you're facing in New Zealand, are they, are they the same problems around the world? And is, is this a massive problem? It, it is, that's a great question, Harley, first, thank you. Um, it is a massive problem. There are very similar problems in, like I can look at Canada and New Zealand and there are a lot of very similarities in terms of just the way the business works. Um, we are not, we, but in New Zealand, there are some very New Zealand specific problems that have to be dealt with 
in that context, but there are also New Zealand specific opportunities that can be dealt with within the New Zealand. That's one of the coolest things is, for example, um, big problem in New Zealand is the monopoly duopoly uh, that are that we experience around building components, right? We, you guys in New Zealand, we pay way more money than than we should for plywood and, and drywall and insulation and a lot of other products just because the government uh, put people in business and then protected those businesses so that they could protect their profits. So breaking that monopoly and my greatest vision for New Zealand is I know that New Zealand will be really making the next step when we start engaging with like um with the Fletchers of the world in terms of regenerative economics and how to start thinking about uh, equity and justice in their in their dealings in New Zealand and how to start looking at at those kind of things. Now those are the those are some of the problems. There's a, there's a whole paper out from the community housing group in New Zealand that will give you 26 problems with New Zealand. But let me tell you the opportunity in New Zealand, which is so amazing, because the Maori already had co-owned, co-stewarded land within their culture. When the um, colonizers came in, their Western system of separation, commodification of land and chopping things up uh, created a situation where the titles to these lands were jointly owned by large communities, right? So in, in, in places like on the East Coast, where where they you know they could have five six hundred people uh, uh, you know owning a piece of land, it's it's been tough for them in terms of how they deal with it on the on the western side. But in today's world, it's kept a lot of the land closer together, right? Because of, of the title. Now it's also allowed for a lot of uh, typical horrible feeling of land through you know getting people who couldn't really represent signing. I mean, there's all these stories. But the cool thing is written into New Zealand's regulations already is the recognition, recogn rec recognition of, of this kind of common ownership. And because of that, there are rules written into the building regulations. There's rules in the financing. This piece of co-ownership is already kind of ahead of the curve compared to the US and Canada because of the traditional ownership structure of the Maori. And so um, in, in a way, the New Zealand can can lead the way and show us how this can be how 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 co ownership or stewardship can uh, work in real time. And so you know, yes, there are huge problems, Harley, in New Zealand, just like there are in Australia, just like there are in Canada, just like there are in the U.S. Some of them are very similar to us, and we would all recognize, and some of them are specific to those those areas. But um, there are also huge opportunities, you know. And the other thing that's really cool about New Zealand is that um, unlike Canada, where, where the reconciliation process is just kind of barely starting and the truth process is just starting, you know, the fact that New Zealand has been through this uh, kind of a truth and reconciliation process for 40 years since the 70s, right, almost 50 years, it's, it's, it's led us to this point where, um, where, where there's been enough both societal acceptance and political acceptance that, that, um, uh, the New Zealand uh, iwi are now uh, on an individual level, on a group by group level, having these settlements with the government that are, are one-time settlements that allow them to um, to kind of get um, what we would call, uh, what would we call that in um, in the United States, we call that um, uh, reparations. You know, I, I don't know exactly what you, but, but the iwi are looking at it, you know, we got this pot of money and we want it to be, we want to plan for 500 years. Right. And the cool part is when they're planning these housing in this whole system, they're thinking generations down the line and how to steward this through generations. They're not thinking of short term gain short. I mean, all of this is, is around creating housing and creating opportunity into the long term for generations and generations. And those kind of examples and where you actually have the resources, not only the ideas, because there's plenty of of indigenous folks in Canada that would love to have the resources and the freedom to do it. But in Canada, unfortunately, the government still treats indigenous people like children, and they don't allow them to, to, um, to kind of do things that are indigenous led. I mean, they're starting to, it's very small, but it's not like it is in, in, um, in New Zealand. I'm really hoping that the New Zealand community can be an example to the Canadian community of what can happen when the when the society and the government start getting on the same page around reconciliation. Now, that's not to say that 
everything's perfect because it isn't. There's a, I mean, we're maybe 20% of the way to 100% of a reconciled bicultural society, but that's way more than Canada, you know, and the US and, and, and Australia. I mean, we're at Canada, we're at like 2%, and the US and, and Australia are hovering around zero. Thank you, Adam. Um, it's great to see the reconciliation that is happening across the world. Like we're coming back to the land and coming back to, 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 to looking at our indigenous people and lots to learn, lots to do still, but I think we're towards the same goal. Uh, so it's, it's good to see that you've been working with them and also supporting them and, and learning from each other on, on that process. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I want to acknowledge that we are on time, past the, the hour. So I want to honor your time. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, Adam, do you want to add your information to the chat? And for anybody else in this call, do you want to add your information to the chat in case you want to get in touch with each other, with other people in the chat, but also with Adam? Uh, I'm going to be closing this uh, session soon with the Karakia, which is a blessing just to finish our time together. But I'm sharing the chat right now, the, the recording, the link to the, to the recording that Adam did in case you wanna see it later, but we will also be adding the recording of this session and the Q&A to our website this week. So have a look there. And thank you so much for coming and joining us today. Thank you, Adam, for being so amazing, for showing us your magic, for teaching us, and, and, and sharing your journey and experience with us. It's really a pleasure to have you here. Thank you so much. Thanks for everybody for coming. Thanks for taking your time out and coming, guys. Thank you. So I'm going to do a closing Karakia now. Unohia, unohia. Unohia, kiteuru, tapunui. Kiawatia, kiamama, tenako, tinana, tewairua, iteara, takata. Koyara, erongo, Pacairia ake kirunga. Kiatina, tina, humie huye, taikie. Thank you, everybody. Thank Adios. You. Kakite. Can you stay for one second, Paula?